Hi, my name is Judy White. I'm the president of Friends of City Hall. We're a nonprofit group uh, dedicated to the preservation and restoration of historic City Hall here in Marine City. And right now, we're sitting in the basement of historic City Hall. Uh, I'm with James Drum, our producer and videographer. And our point this morning is to make a video about the interior of the building. Thinking about that, I decided that a convenient way to go about introducing you to the interior of City Hall and talking about some of our plans and about some of the history of City Hall was to be down in a basement. So I called the video title From Bottom to Top. <laughs> kind of corny, but uh, here we are, down at the bottom. So I want you in, in the beginning to look at the details of this wall down here. This is Fieldstone and probably collected from right here in Marine City to begin the construction of uh, the foundation of this building. We're sitting approximately four and a half feet below grade level, which is just below the edge of the window over there. So you want to imagine that they started this building at the end of 1883 or the beginning of 1884 by excavating out the, the, uh, the basement and space for the foundation. The designers of the building were George DeWitt Mason and Zachariah Rice. They're architects from um, Detroit, Michigan. Uh, they were very young men. They were at the beginning of their career. Uh, Mason was only 27 years old when he got the contract in late 1883 um, to draw the plans for this building. So a foundation of uh, gathered field stone and, and cement, and it's topped by a brick, which is ordinarily referred to as, I suppose, a common brick or a mud brick. Common lore here in Marine City says that these bricks were made right here in town, that the clay was excavated over on DeGersey Street and about a quarter mile from where the clay was excavated, uh, two brick kilns used to function on North Bell River Road. I tend to believe that lore because someone took me over to one of those properties and still surviving is a small brick building that would have been the office for the brick oven or brick kiln. These, um, let me hold this up a little bit. If you're looking at the face of the brick, it's, this part would be referred to as a stretcher. The pattern in the walls, and you can see this on the outside if you pay attention, is a series of stretchers like this, several rows high, and then the bricks on the side, that's called a header. It's, a, it's called an English pattern. So, homemade bricks, local field stone, and these walls are four bricks thick. When you look at a brick on edge like that, or this way, it's called a width, W-Y-T-H-E, a width. So this wall is four widths thick, which means it's extraordinarily sturdy and dependable and it is, at this point, 137 years old. There is no sign of any shifting or moving. And furthermore, no signs of water penetration. This basement is extremely dry. The walls are dry. Um, the building is very, very sound. From here, I'd like to take you into some other rooms here in the basement and um, explore some other uh, characteristics of the building. So let's go right next door. We've stepped a little bit westward um, into the next room of the basement. And what you're looking at here is the manifold for the fire suppression system in the building. This was installed last year and it is uh, a requirement for occupancy of this building. 
uh, there has never been a fire protection or fire suppression system in the building. So um, we uh, brought it in through this point right here, which is excavated underneath the foundation. And uh, we put in a new water line that runs uh, a little over 80 feet to um, Pearl Street uh, here on the north side of the building. This was an um, extremely expensive investment, but a very, very worthy one that's going to ensure the survival of this building for another 137 years. Let me show you something about a filing system from the past right over here. Well, this doesn't look very neat or tidy. Um, these things are stacked up in storage for right now. But what you're looking at right here are a series of little drawers. And each one would have had a label on it, as I think you probably can see right now. And the purpose of these drawers was to hold filing cards. This is the filing card system for the city of Marine City. It uh, held I would say three quarters of the city records for um, many, many decades. And later on in the video, we're going to go uh, upstairs and I'll show you the little room where all of these were installed, um, the original filing room of City Hall. One day we'll have this wood nicely cleaned up and oiled and back in position so that everyone can take a look at uh, a piece of original city uh, management equipment here in Marine City. Let's go this way. We're in the southeast corner of the basement of City Hall, and I want you to take a look at the color of these bricks. Once upon a time, there was a um, wood paneling over these walls. And as we uh, invested in, in demolition of non-period additions to the building, paneling came off and we saw this. And touching it comes off on your finger because it's coal dust. And that told us that the function of this room, once upon a time, was uh, to hold the coal that heated the building. And the chances are that this window was actually a coal chute at one point in time. So the truck would back up here, dump the coal. We think that they started heating the building with wood and of course ultimately uh, transferred to uh, the use of coal as the heating um, fuel. There's no evidence that um, natural gas was pumped into the building until modern times. Let's move on. I wanted to give credit to someone here in Marine City who's been uh, extremely generous uh, to Friends of City Hall and to historic uh, City Hall and of course to the city itself. And that's uh, Mr. Ray Skatartik. Ray owns a company called uh, Hearthside Heating and Ray donated a complete heating an air conditioning system to um, Friends of City Hall and also the cost of installation. And that equipment is right, running right now and you know it's February but here we are uh, totally comfortable in this building. So um, thank you Ray. Uh, you are a dear heart and we are very grateful. We're standing in the uh, northeast corner of the basement of City Hall, and this is the remains of what would have been the woman's bathroom um, during the days when city government was still um, based here in historic City Hall. I remember seeing it when it was intact, the, the uh, fixtures were quite old, and the, in doing some of the demolition down here, it became clear that this toilet facility was not original to the building. It was something that was added to the structure many, many years after the building was completed. Uh, there is no evidence anywhere in the building of uh, toilet facilities and running water being part of the original design. 
So that tells me that for people that worked in the building, they had an outhouse. The location of the outhouse probably was in the um, north yard of Heritage Square. Uh, there's been some excavation here and there, but to this point in time, we've never come across uh, um, the potential location for where that outhouse would be. But we hope that one day we'll discover it. We're in the largest room of the basement of City Hall. Friends of City Hall has a business plan, kind of dreams for the future of what we would like to do once we get fire suppression and an elevator in the building and make it accessible to all. Uh, and those plans involve turning the building into a rental venue and a performance center. For offices, um, we thought that this basement area would be really perfect. And so perhaps in, in this section right here, um, a managerial style office uh, for someone who was hired to run the building, maybe be the, um, the venue manager. Uh, I think it's clear that the public love the building, love the style and the character of the building. I think it would be very attractive to people who wanted to celebrate their wedding here. So wedding receptions, parties, uh, celebrations of all kinds I think would be quite successful. And this is to say nothing of the value and the potential of the Opera House upstairs as a uh, performance center, as a kind of cultural center for Marine City. So those are our plans. We're standing in um, the uh, southwest corner of original City Hall, and this space was uh, constructed to be the fire hall. Uh, a lot of additions here, walls being added decades later, this ceiling of unknown origin, much after the construction of the building. But this archway had a double door and it admitted the uh, fire wagon. And that fire wagon would be, have been a hand-pulled and hand-pumped uh, mechanism. Uh, volunteers showed up if an alarm was sounded that there was a fire in town, of which, by the way, there were lots of them because much of the construction was just solid wood, uh, heated by wood, perhaps heated by coal. So there were always um, accidents, there were always house fires. This pumper um, would be drawn by a bunch of volunteers who would run with it to the fire, and they would throw the hose into either the St. Clair River or the Bell River and start pumping furiously on long handles on either side of the pump mechanism to suck up the water and then to send it in a stream against the burning building. It's uh, actually a rather powerful pump, and there is a story that is recorded over at the uh, museum here in town of men pumping hard enough to send that water right to the summit of the bell tower of the Catholic Church. So that was the original firefighting equipment. Um, they eventually put in a water a city water building in 1885, which is located on uh, North Main Street. And that water building uh, had a big pump within it, and they connected it to a water main that ran um, into city center. And so they switched from a hand-drawn pumper wagon to a hose wagon. So if the signal was sent, they brought the hoses to the location of the fire and they connected to a hydrant uh, to fight fire. And that's the way it was done until uh, 1924. And in 1924, they invested in the first mechanized um, uh, fire truck, pumper truck. 
um, that was a good old American La France. Uh, and we have a still picture which we'll show you about this. That was a fairly small machine and it probably fit through this archway and um, fit comfortably in this space. But as time passed and fire trucks got bigger and bigger, um, they couldn't use this space anymore. And so they added onto the building, I understand the addition was put on in 1937, and it became the home for multiple fire, fire trucks uh, for Marine City. Let's take a look in this room here. We're standing inside the parking bay for the uh, fire trucks of old. And by um, 1937, this became an available space. I, I know that the firemen were using it uh, to change and clean up after a fire call. Um, but otherwise, it was um, not being used to its fullest capacity. The city made the decision to move the police department to this building, and they did that in 1940. Um, so the space was cut up into a series of offices, and this would have been the reception window where the public would come in and uh, speak to an officer on duty. And if you have um, a police department in the building, you need a jail, so I'm gonna take you to jail uh, soon and show you what that was like circa 1940. So we're standing in the main room of City Hall on the main floor, and we've nicknamed this the Mason Room in honor of George DeWitt Mason, the architect. The overall dimensions of this building on the outside, uh, 45 feet wide, 90 feet long. Well, when you take a look at this room, significantly smaller than those dimensions. This one open hall had multiple functions in the beginning. It was the meeting place for the town council. We would call it the city commission these days. In addition, it was a courtroom. It functioned as the court for the municipal court of Marine City. I have a friend, uh, Bill Daniels, who was a judge in that court, and he served here until the late 60s when um, municipal court was replaced by the creation of um, the 72nd District Court and the new building put up on um, South Parker. So, town council meeting place, courtroom, it was also the place where um, certain numbers of uh, city clerks and such had their desks. Um, it could function as a voting precinct for the city and, um, and other kinds of general large uh, municipal gatherings. The room was plastered and some wallpaper was used on the west wall as decoration. Over the years, as the city grew and there were more people who were employed here, they started to cut this room up with the addition of um, walls, more doorways. Uh, they didn't like the high ceiling, probably too high to heat, so they put in a drop ceiling. Um, lighting. We had to demo all of that and take it back to the original brick. So as those non-period additions came away, what was revealed is an absolutely gorgeous uh, original 
brick of the building, and these walls are weight-bearing, so they're very, very thick. Ultimately, we will be able to wash this brick down, bring it, bring out the natural color, and we intend to keep it revealed. And one thing that you see when uh, you can look at the original brick is the wide variety of skill that was employed by the brick masons in creating archways, um, lintels, and so on. It's really quite impressive. Now, um, in addition to this large space, there had to be some confined, more private offices, and they're located on the north side of the building. I want to take you there next to see it. We're standing in the northeast uh, office room of City Hall. This is the original door into the room right here. This is an addition that they cut in many decades later. This room functioned as a um, private office for probably the um, uh, mayor, uh, perhaps the city treasurer, and so on. Over time, as more employees uh, came to work for Marine City, there was need for more private office space. So that's when this door was cut through uh, the brick. A wall was installed right here. Voila, we now have uh, two offices. And uh, the room next door, which had been the um, second office space, was no longer accessible because they had turned it into the jail. Uh, I'll take you in there in a minute, but I want to show you one thing about the room um, in which we're standing, and that is the survival remnants of the original chimney, which is against the north wall. Uh, that chimney was a source of the main heating for this floor of City Hall. There would be a iron uh, kind of potbelly stove there, probably heated first by wood, later on of course by coal. Um, so we know well, there was that kind of warmth in the building. It would have been decades before uh, natural gas was made accessible um, to this building and gas heaters installed. Um, probably done in the um, 30s, maybe the early 40s. So somebody had to keep maintaining those fires originally. And that brings to mind something else as well. As you think about the city workers at desks here in the original years, how did they see what they were doing? I mean, those are big windows, double hung, they open, they're beautiful draft, they come in, lots of light. Today it's a bright sunny day, it's not bad. What about a gloomy day? Because there was no electricity in the building to begin. And as I said, no gas service. So the answer to that, of course, is oil lamps. So think about working by an oil lamp of a gloomy winter afternoon. I suppose the oil lamp provided some heat and that was comforting. Um, but what about electricity? Thomas Edison had perfected the incandescent bulb in um, 1879. Within a few years of that invention, all over the eastern half of the United States, little towns and cities and communities starting building their own generators and creating electricity on a small scale and sharing it with businesses and so on. And that was true here in Marine City. There was a grain mill on South Bell River Road near Hill Street, nicknamed the Roller Mill. And those people installed a small generator and began selling electricity to not only their own company, but a few businesses and homes around them. And that's how on a slow basis, uh, beginning in um, around 1889, uh, 
Marine City became electrified. That generator, the roller mill generator, was purchased by Detroit Edison in 1915. Detroit Edison by that time was the big company in the state of Michigan and very, very rapidly um, the uh, electric lines went up and electric service was made accessible to everyone. So that then would have of course been introduced uh, here into City Hall. So I do not know the date when wiring was first put in on this building, but certainly by um, 1915, uh, it would have been available. I had said a little earlier that uh, here the main room of City Hall functioned as a court and there is one surviving picture that shows a very long table arranged over here that might have been um, the court bench so to speak. If you're found guilty and you were sentenced to jail boy it didn't take more than 10 steps and whammo you went right through this door and behind bars. So follow me. Well, here we are. It's the Husco. There are three cells here. They're tiny, tiny. Um, room enough for a cot, there's no other furniture that survives, it's left. And when you look in, you suddenly realize, uh-oh, there's no toilet facilities either. So someone locked up here overnight or perhaps a little bit longer um, while they were waiting to be taken to a much larger jail north of here, like the sheriff's jail, they might have been provided with a blanket, maybe a pillow if they were lucky, and a bucket. And that was it. Now, right behind the camera over here is a door in the north wall of the building. If there was an outhouse in the north yard, Perhaps prisoners are taken out one after another and allowed to use the facilities out in the yard. In any way, by any stretch, um, it's a grim environment, painted the appropriately grim gray color. Unfortunately, in the history of um, this jail, and I would date the start of this jail, by the way, to 1940, when the police department moved here. Um, a sad event was the suicide of um, one of the, um, a young man who had been arrested and put in jail. I don't think his crime was that severe, but I think his despondency was, and so he took his own life. Um, very sad to relate. So this is, a strange tiny little room at um, toward the west end of um, the building. It's uh, just behind the main room and this was the filing system for Marine City. So all those little cubbies that you see going up the wall, each one of those would have held a drawer and in it filing cards uh, and information on tax rolls, uh, voter registration and so on. And for larger documents um, to the left um, of the, your view, uh, books, uh, drawings, plans stood up on end would have uh, been stored in the opposing shelf system. And it's clear from some of the labeling that still survives that this was used as a system well into the 1950s, if not later. We're standing in the east foyer of City Hall, and I wanted to bring attention to the reconstruction of um, the north half of the grand staircase. 
This is um, a work that we got um, underway a little over a year ago, and it's taken some time to get it finished. It isn't a simple job. It has a lot of mechanical difficulties. The material that you're looking at is oak, and to get it to take on the shapes and configurations that you see here, uh, it's necessary to steam the oak. And these moldings, these had to be cut to match the originals, so the company that did the work uh, had to create um, unique cutting tools uh, to match up to the original. So why was this necessary? Well, I had mentioned how the city grew and the number of employees increased and they needed more space for offices. So to some of the people back in the late 60s or perhaps it was the early 70s, the way to achieve a new office here was to come in and cut away this staircase back to where you can see the gray paint. Having smashed through this staircase and gained this number of extra square feet, they put up some two by fours and some inexpensive wood paneling. They installed another wall over here and you can see the ghost line in the floor of where that stood. And now suddenly, voila, you have another office. And I can remember in 2005 coming here uh, to file some paperwork with the uh, building inspector. This was his office and uh, it was a desk and a chair and some files and that was about it. Very, very tiny. No sign that this kind of beautiful staircase had been demolished in order to have an office. Well, one of the first things we did is to get rid of those false walls and to expose this area and to find someone to come in and to replace the staircase. So the original design of the building is a winding staircase up both sides of the foyer. And there we have it. We're back again to two staircases. We're standing in um, the foyer on the second floor of City Hall and you have a view into the Opera House. Opera House, Opera House. I think it was Shakespeare who said, what's in a name? Well, this is uh, the 19th century and it's 1884 and this is the entertainment's room. Uh, but why call it an opera house? Marine City wasn't the first city in Michigan to create an opera house. It was a 19th century tradition. I'm gonna read you a little list of some other opera houses. Uh, for example, Crosswell Opera House. That was built in 1866. Howell, Howell Opera House. I've been there, it's wonderful. 1881. Uh, the Tibbetts Opera House in Coldwater, Michigan, 1882. Marine City, 1884. Rochester Opera Block, 1890. Calumet Opera House, way up in the Keweenaw, 1898. So what were they doing? Well, they were places for touring road shows, but the word opera had culture and refinement associated with it, not something bawdy and questionable in terms of morality. So Opera House was a polite name. What happened? Well, I know historically one operetta was performed up at Calumet, but other than that, it was touring road shows out of New York and other places. It was guest speakers, um, musical groups, uh, comedians, and other kinds of entertainers. And here for Marine City, this was also a place for 
community dances, and they were very popular and they were frequent. And I have talked to elderly people in town who in their youth came every Saturday to a dance here at City Hall. Um, the floor is large, it's actually old growth, um, narrow width maple floor, it's an excellent as a dance floor. And the room has superb uh, acoustics if you, you're here to hear a concert. So what we're looking at and what I'm describing is reach really a cultural hub of Marine City. Uh, predating the movies and TV and you know all sorts of video, uh, this was where you could get high quality entertainment, have great fun, have um, your dances uh, to circulate, maybe to flirt, um, and just have a great and safe time. All right. Um, just want to say a few words about uh, the stage here in the Opera House. It's a proscenium arch stage. Um, it is relatively shallow, so there isn't much uh, room at all to be considered as a backstage. And also the wings are extremely limited. Uh, there's uh, 10, maybe 15 feet maximum on uh, either side. Um, the stage itself is adequate for the work of a chorus or a small orchestra, but it certainly would not hold a large orchestra. Uh, there's access to the stage from the house here and there, and access to the green room is achieved by um, the wings here on the south side, and there's a staircase down. And I'll take you to the green room and, and show that to you because there's an interesting history on um, that particular room. So I don't know if you can tell from the quality of my voice here, but the, the sound is very lively in the room. And when we bring an orchestra in, it sounds terrific. Singers love the room too for its great acoustics. So this will work perfectly as a place for concerts, small performances, um, and uh, certainly if uh, you wanted to host your wedding here, a great room for a wedding reception also. From here, I wanna take you up into the balcony and the tower room. So uh, friends, we are up in the balcony uh, overlooking the opera house. There are four, perhaps you wanna call them five tiers for seating up here. And uh, obviously you've got a very good view of the house, a very good view of the stage. And the sound is really good up here as well. It carries very nicely from the stage back here to the balcony. This balcony has a couple of really interesting features, one of which is it still carries the original paint. And um, I'm looking at a wall that still has uh, the colors and the stenciling visible. Uh, downstairs in the main room, there's evidence that that room was also decorated with a simple kind of stenciling. And certainly, when we get to the point of repairing plaster and repainting, we will reintroduce an appropriate um, period style of stenciling to the room. Now, the other thing about the balcony that's really interesting is what's here to my right. And through that little door is the southeast tower of the building. Now that tower used to have windows that opened. They've been replaced with modern windows that do not. Well, I wanted to stress the fact that those original windows could be opened. And if they were opened, that would create quite an airflow in the building, especially if you open some of the doors down below and by the staircase, when you think about this, you're going to get a draw of air. And that little room and those windows are going to function like a heat sink 
or what perhaps is better described as a passive air conditioning system. This was very common in 19th century architecture. One of the easiest ways to illustrate it is to think of the style of house called the Italianate style. Every Italianate uh, style house has a cupola at the top, the apex of the roof line. All those windows used to open. It's right over the staircases, a couple of flights of the house. A passive air conditioning system, exhausting the hot air out of the building, drawing in the cooler air from the basement and ground level. So, very clever, those 19th century folks. On top of that, that became the graffiti room. And for a while, when this building wasn't carefully managed and kids and some adults had access to that room, they went in and they signed their names. So let's go take a look. I now want to take you to see a room that currently we're calling the mezzanine. Um, mezzanines are spaces that are sandwiched between two floors. So when we go through that stairs up there, we're going to go into a room that's underneath the floor of the stage and set above the top part of the fire hall, which is directly below. So, what it was originally, um, and the, the correct name for it, I guess, would be the green room. I can just see right here around the corner the door that we think uh, was used by actors and musicians to come into the building. They would have stepped into this little foyer and then up the stairs and into the green room to wait for their call to appear on stage. So let's go up and take a look. Well, now we're up in the, um, in the mezzanine area, and you can tell by the scope of this room, it's not a terribly big space, but it would be uh, completely uh, adequate for an assembly of uh, actors or musicians waiting for their time um, to be called up on stage. Now, this room was converted into a residence in the 1920s, and I want to tell you that story. In 1927, um, Thomas Furtaw was hired by Marine City to be um, the driver of the uh, fire truck, which they had purchased back in uh, 1924. Thomas Furtow was married to a gal named Edith, and they had two children, Walker and uh, Albert, two sons. And in 1928, unfortunately, Edith passed away. In 1929, of course, we have the Great Crash, the Great Depression began, and uh, the city moved uh, Thomas Furtow and his two sons into these rooms. And Thomas lived here as both the driver of the um, fire truck and as the uh, manager and janitor of all of City Hall building. In 1931, uh, Albert married Edith's sister, Ida and it was a very happy marriage and uh, they proceeded to have over the years four more children um, one of whom was a friend of mine bill Furtaw. 
So um, that would make six children and two adults living in this tiny space. So from 1929 until 1944, they resided here. And Bill Furtaw and his brothers and sisters um, all reported that they loved living here. It was fun, it was kind of an adventure. It's a tiny, tiny space, but somehow that really didn't matter and um, in, they were quite happy instead. So an interesting story. Um, those four children um, were born here and delivered by Dr. Gersey, a very famous and well-loved physician who lived here in Marine City, a man of um, real social conscience and contribution to uh, his, uh, his chosen city. In talking with Bill many years later, and my association with Bill goes back actually 50 years ago, um, he had such fond memories of living here and it was sort of exciting to find out we had connections uh, to uh, Marine City. So, a little story. Well, we've covered a little bit about uh, the inner life of City Hall. The inside isn't very pretty right now, but the spaces are rid of all the non-period intrusions and modifications, and um, they're ready to, to take on new life. We hope to invigorate this building and all who visit it with new life, new excitement, and the sense of new fresh possibilities. But to do that, we need you. We need you to join our group and to volunteer some time and effort to help us. We need you to talk to people about this building and to tell them what you know about it. We need you to give what you can to fund the elevator and the restorations. We need you to encourage other people and institutions to donate in support of our efforts. You know, heritage is something that you inherit, but you don't own it. What you own is the responsibility for taking care of it for the next generation. That regard is infectious, and the treasures of history are preserved. I want to thank James Drum for his great work on making this video, and I want to thank you, our audience, for sticking with us and watching it. Thanks so much. Bye-bye now.